Now this is a very exciting video to make. This device here, this new kit light, is a 222 nanometer wavelength germicidal light. And what it means is that if you put this in a room and turn it on, it starts deactivating bacteria, viruses and mold in the air. But interestingly, because it's a very specific and narrow wavelength, 222 nanometers, it is safe for humans. It will not pass through the outer layer of human skin or the moisture layer in your eyes. And what that means is you can sterilize the room while people are in it. So this video is going to be broken down in a couple of sections. We'll take a look at the kit as it comes, and then I'll show you a spectral analysis of the output using this extremely specialist and expensive spectrometer that has been loaned to me. And this only covers from 200 nanometer up to about 400 nanometer. And we'll be able to check the traditional wavelengths of the older style mercury vapor ones, the ones that do cause skin and eye irritation, and the new Eczymer lights. So let's take a look at the kit this comes in. So the equipment here was kindly sent to me by Naomi Wu, who has been working extensively on UVC sterilization. She started as uh, during the pandemic, I was making lots of videos about UVC, Naomi was making videos about UVC, Naomi has gone further and actually manufactured products. So here it is, it's the Lantern product uh, for UVC 222 nanometer Eczymer lamp. And if I open this up, very nicely presented, little magnetic catches and everything, here's what you get inside. You get the Nukit light. You get a power supply with multiple adapters that does operate at 12 volts, so this could be used effectively off-grid. You've got an extension cable for it. You've got a bracket for mounting it in the wall. And you've also got an uh, occupancy detector. Now, traditionally, with the more dangerous UVC tubes of the past, the 254 nanometer ones that could cause skin and eye irritation, with those, the occupancy detector was used to turn them off when you entered the room. This is different. Because this is safe for human exposure, the occupancy detector actually turns it on when you enter the room, so the lifespan of the unit is maximised. That's a very nice feature. OK, let's dig it out, set it up, and we'll test it with the spectrometer. One moment, please. So for the first part of our spectral analysis experiment, I'm going to use a traditional UVC germicidal tube based on this mercury vapour discharge, and that should indicate 254 nanometers approximately on the spectrometer. Let's try that now. The tube is on. I shall limit my exposure to this. I'm going to start at recording the spectral output of this, and it's already picked up that peak. Right, so I shall turn this light off. I shall pause this. And we can take a closer look at the results of that. So if I zoom down on this, I may have turned the lights off. It's got quite a dim display. And I'll take the exposure off a bit. That's better. And focus on that. So we'll zoom down. And you can see the wavelength at the bottom here is in the 254 nanometer section. So that kind of proves this is working Okay, right, okay, let's do the next test, which is with the Eczymer lamp. One moment, please. So now I have the Eczymer lamp running with its mysterious purple glow in there, the, the plasma discharge, which is exactly what's happening. And now I'm going to bring the unit in and I'm going to start scanning again. Let it grab the wavelength, latches it straight away, and let's take a closer look at that wavelength. I don't have to worry about turning this off because it is safe for human exposure. A lot of research has been done into this, including the very exciting uh, just actually having people look directly at it. So I'm going to take the exposure off here. I'm going to zoom down on this. Focus under here. And here we are at the very narrow wavelength it puts out, 222 nanometers very impressive. That slight curve at the end there is just the ambient light in here. It's catching the very end of this sort of visible spectrum because this goes right up to 450 nanometer and it's getting the blue from the LEDs. Okie dokie. Now let's take this apart because Naomi has said we can do that. So I shall just uh, unplug this right now and I shall turn this super heavy chunky device off off. 
and I shall, well, tell you what, I'll go and grab some tools and we can open this up. One moment, please. And let's explore. I do believe this clips together. I hope I'm not going to break it. Don't want to break it. It's coming apart relatively easily. I think, well, it started coming apart relatively easily. It is coming apart relatively easily. Naomi says, don't get too excited about what's inside. It's strangely simple. Uh, the construction of these, the magic and the expense is partly in the lamp itself. And the driver, which is all potted in here, it's just a classic, probably a Royer oscillator driver. But specifically now mentioned that the filter glass in the front here to protect the tube is one of the most expensive bits because uh, it has to pass that uh, 222 nanometer wavelength. Thread lock. That's nice. Let's grab some screwdrivers and take some screws out. I'm going to have to be careful not to touch the lamp. I kind of want to see if it puts out any other wavelengths without the glass there, if there are any auxiliary wavelengths. Now, I will be explaining the technology behind these lamps uh, later in this video. You don't have to watch that far. You only have to watch as much as you want. But I will go deep and I'll also include lots of information in the video description uh, covering all the technology that I've mentioned here. Naomi has been uh, doing lots of tests with these. She's sent them off to labs where they've been tested for their effect on viral loads in rooms. There's the, there's the bulb, there's a lamp. Uh, interesting research with computer simulations to show what they actually found from the, the physical testing. They put in uh, a safe virus linked to the COVID into the room and they did two tests. They did one where they circulated in the room with four of these lights, one in each corner, basically firing with a fan down onto a table. And I think they did a surface test there. And then they did another one where they had a port that took air back out to determine that after the turbulence of the room, what existed of that viral activity. Here's the, the bulb. It's not that exciting. Oh, it does have an outer layer of glass. That's how they got rid of the... Oh no, has it? Hold on. Oh, that mesh is on the outside, but it is very close. That's probably why it's not creating a uh, corona discharge on the surface and the ozone that you'd expect with that. Well, fundamentally, this is it. There's not a lot inside right enough. There's a little fan for cooling. It's mounted in the back. There is the lamp itself and there is the 12 volt, uh, one amp, I think it is, 12 watt power supply. A little um, switching power supply you'd normally expect to see associated with uh, cold cathode lights, which is more or less how this is operating. Rightio, shall we go into the science now? Yes, we shall. We shall go into the science. One moment, please. OK, let's take a look at the science behind this. Incidentally, I noticed when I had this open that uh, the whole assembly in here is well designed because it's got the tripod mount that you can screw the tripod or the wall bracket into because this is designed for use, quick deployment in uh, areas where you just need to provide that sterilization. But the plastic housing inside, as well as basically accommodating the reflector and holding the tube in place, the compartment for the resin uh, filled high voltage power supply is all built into that one central core. Very neat. It's a nicely evolved design. Let's take a look at the bulb inside though. So here's a close up. Incidentally, I did uh, take a uh, spectrometer uh, sample of the tube in its own without this cover and uh, it's the exact same narrow wavelength. The cover is protection for the tube itself to stop it getting dirt in it presumably or contamination. It lets you clean it if needs be, by just keeping it a clear of dust. So if you look at the tube, you may be able to see inside there's a sort of metal core, but that is inside a glass sleeve. And I'll show you this in a moment, uh, what's involved. But there is a void in here, and then there's a uh, mesh over the outside. The reason the outer mesh is a mesh, um, the outer electrode is a mesh, should I say, is so that the light can come out through it. 
And it's very similar in a way. You'll be getting deja vu if you've seen my ozone videos because here is a dielectric barrier tube ozone generator. This is the type used for sterilizing cabinets. And in this case, there's a little glass tube and an electrode up the middle, but not sleeved. Um, and it's got a gas in there. And then it's got the outer mesh. In the case of this one, it's a very loose outer mesh and it's literally designed to couple electrically over to the surface of the inside the glass via the gas and create a capacitively coupled discharge onto this mesh that creates the ozone. And this will create trace levels of ozone. That's maybe why there's a fan there to help stir the air around it. But uh, I didn't really, I couldn't smell the ozone off it, which is is good. It may be the fact because this is such a close fitting mesh and because they've kept the energy levels just at the right level because it isn't optimised for ozone generation. But uh, the reason I've got this uh, fluorescent tube here is to show, like the traditional tube has electrodes inside, the Exheimer tube doesn't, which means it's uh, potentially going to have a decent life because uh, the electrodes are usually one of the biggest weaknesses. Let's take a look at the science. So, there is a glass vial with effectively, this is a simplified version with an electrode on either side, and that glass vial is filled with krypton and chlorine gas. Now, krypton is a noble gas. It's very, very inert. It doesn't like mixing with other chemicals as such. And in 1971, scientists discovered that they could make krypton bond onto a chlorine uh, atom uh, by applying a high voltage discharge. What they didn't realize at the time was what was happening. Um, they just saw they could combine it in an unstable state, and that was it. So, in the case of these tubes, you've got the uh, the vial of the gas, the glass tube gas, which has to be a very special glass to pass the 222 nanometer wavelength. It has to be ultra-high purity. And then we get the electrodes on the outside connect across the output of a high voltage transformer. Um, it's very low power, but it's a very uh, high frequency applied to that. And it causes that sort of dielectric discharge between the two electrodes. It basically couples through the glass, through the gas, and then through the glass again to the electrode. In the case of the uh, light in Naomi's uh, unit, it has the outer tube and then it's got an inner tube. And these are sealed together. The gas is in this void here. And you've got a solid uh, electrode in the middle. And then you've got your mesh electrode on the outside just to pass that light out when it happens. So the name eczemer or eczimer comes from excited dimer and it relates to these uh, short-lived molecules. I think it means diatomic molecules but the uh, odd thing is that when you raise the krypton and chlorine gas, when you apply them uh, to that high voltage discharge, they do combine temporarily as uh, krypton chloride but then the real magic happens when they revert back to their normal state because they're continually oscillating between krypton chloride and they're just free krypton and chlorine in that tube. But when they revert back to their original base state, they emit a photon. And that photon, because of the chemical structure, is exactly 222 nanometers. So that also is the advantage of not having internal electrodes that could basically pollute that. You've got pure krypton and chlorine inside that tube. And as long as you've got that high purity, you're theoretically only going to get that single wavelength. And also because the krypton and chlorine are bonding and then dis uh, breaking apart again continually, theoretically it's not going to deplete. I'm not sure how long these will last. I know that uh, the Eczimer lasers have been around for a long time. But you've got other uh, gas mixes that just xenon on its own. Uh, is it xenon on its own? I think it is xenon raised up to its excited state and dropped back in. It emits another uh, ultraviolet uh, wavelength, a, a shorter wavelength still. But that's interesting how something, you know, it doesn't seem that complex, but most of the expense in this at the moment is the fact it's a custom-made tube and it is early days for this technology. But I could see this technology being used in hospitals, uh, food manufacturing environments, freezers and cold rooms to help avoid things like listeria and uh, other foodborne undesirables uh, surviving in that sort of environment. And uh, although it's early days, as of yet, there's no adverse effects detected in humans either through exposure to skin or the eyes. 
Um, and that's a stark difference to the old 254 nanometer wavelength from these tubes, which uh, did affect, you know, it would cause a sunburn effect on the skin and also it would cause that arc flash effect in your eyes where it felt like someone had thrown sand in them and it would be quite uncomfortable for a long period of time, uh, but would eventually heal up. Um, so this theoretically doesn't have that. So there we have it, the Nukit. Uh, 222 nanometer light for putting into occupied spaces and sterilizing the air. It's early days yet, but this is a technology that is going to be very interesting to watch as it evolves.